Welcome to sections 3.9 and 3.10, where we're going to wrap up mutations by talking about how you kind of get mutations and what they tend to do to you. So starting off with the whole causes, there's two basic ways you can get a mutation. The first is going to be random when you're going through and copying your DNA into something else. So you can get this through DNA replication, and so that would be where you're copying DNA to another piece of DNA, so you're making one piece of DNA into two, and while you're doing that, you can screw up and so you can get a change. Uh, this could also happen when you're doing transcription, although that would normally not be as big of a deal because you just screw up one mRNA, uh, but typically the DNA would still be okay, but it'd still be a mess up that would lead to a wrong protein. So copying, you can get screw ups. This is unavoidable. This is not something you, have, you can uh, really affect too much. It's gonna happen one way or another. Now, the environmental one is more interesting. So this one is going to be in response to what we commonly call mutagens, which are just substances or conditions that tend to lead to a higher rate of mutations. So you can try to avoid being around mutagens, and by avoiding mutagens, you could minimize at least some of your risk of mutation. Not get rid of it entirely, because you'll always have some of this random one, though, but you can at least minimize it. Now, of these mutagens, these environmental conditions, there's three basic groups we can say. The first is going to be radiation. So this is UV light, x-rays, gamma rays. Uh, this is stuff that's actually a lot, it's more or less light, but it's not visible light. It's going to be higher energy than that, more energetic. And so these parts can actually kind of go through your skin, through your cells, and hit your DNA and transfer some of that energy, causing the DNA to basically react or to get altered. And this process of reacting, altering, uh, messing with your DNA can lead to mutations. So this is why they tell you to wear sunscreen. This is why they put the lead vest at the dentist when they do the x-ray so they don't expose more of your body to it. This is why they don't just sit there like you see in like old cartoons where they'd have the x-rays and you just see people's bones showing up because they just sat there bombarding them. That would not be good. Uh, this is why if Superman's using his x-ray vision, you should probably not be in his way because if he's looking at you, he's possibly giving you cancer. So you just got to watch that. Then there's chemicals. So you see there's several different uh, mutagens. Because they cause cancer, you might see them also called carcinogens. Uh, but there's a bunch of those in cigarette smoke. There's also plenty of other chemicals that you can come across where they might say that it is carcinogenic or that it is a mutagen. And so it's not like it's just cigarettes. There's a bunch of different chemicals that can ultimately go in and start to react, bind to, or alter your DNA in your cells that get absorbed. And so those would then be mutagens. So there's a whole bunch of different chemicals that can fall into this. And then the last bit, there are some diseases, some viruses or bacteria that can secrete substances or like viruses, they obviously insert their DNA. So their DNA can contain things that are mutated, like versions of a gene that are mutated that they grabbed from some other host when they came. Uh, they could also insert themselves in a specific way into your DNA in a way that they break a gene. So if they kind of insert themselves in the middle of a gene, it can damage that gene so that gene doesn't work. So certain bacteria and certain viruses, HPV being probably the poster child, because HPV is now there's vaccines for it, but it's uh, the cause, I believe, of most of the cervical cancer cases in women uh, and many of the ovarian cancer cases. And so they're trying to vaccinate people, not because HPV as a disease is so dangerous and its symptoms, but because HPV can lead down the road to cancer, which is a big deal. Now, let's discuss kind of what can happen if you get a mutation. So on this spectrum, you're going to have where something can be harmful, and on the edge of harmful, on the edge of this gradient, you have where it causes death. Then all along this gradient, you'll have where ultimately it does some harm, you know, like you're pretty messed up, uh, something big's going on, so you can't digest things properly, but you're alive, and you can start to move to eventually in the middle here. We have what we call the neutral mutations, which are ones that don't seem to have much of an effect on you, if any. And so those ones, yes, there's a mutation, but overall, you're still you. It's not helping you or hurting you. And so these are pretty common mutations. We've talked about like in those introns. Uh, we've talked about like silent mutations. So there are these neutral ones. And then there are some, 
they're probably the rarest, but there are some that actually improve the functioning of that protein or give you a new protein that does something that's beneficial to you. And so these would be beneficial mutations. So these ones typically help you survive and ultimately help you reproduce. And they tend to become more popular then because the individuals who have them live better and reproduce more. So that gene that they possess, that mutation now, gets passed on to their offspring who can pass it on to their offspring until eventually a population can have it pretty much as the standard. You know, so it started off in one person, but now it could be normal 100 generations from now because it's just good. You know, helps you get by this whole natural selection bit. Now, before we kind of wrap up, I want to make sure you realize that mutations as a whole would seem to be rare. Even a pretty crappy DNA uh, polymerase enzyme is going to have an accuracy usually of at least 1 in 10,000. So that means that they are correct 900, 9,999 9, 9, times out of 10,000. That's way more accurate than you guys. You know, you guys get an A if you get one out of 10 wrong and that's it. You know, so nine out of 10 right, you're amazing. For them, they've got to get 9,999 right and that's not even the best one. Some are better than that. There's different DNA polymerase enzymes, uh, RNA polymerase, there's other enzymes. So based on them, usually they're at least this accurate to start. But I also want you to realize that there are enzymes that go through and proofread. So they look at the DNA that we've went through and replicated, copied, and so they'll go through and look to see if they can find a section that's messed up. And if they do, what they can do is cut out that section. So you can see here they've kind of removed it. And then they can come in and rebind it with the appropriate nitrogen bases so they can fix the error. So once we've fixed the error, you're now normally talking about where the number of errors is somewhere around one in the millions. Uh, in some cases, you're talking many, many millions, you know, tens, maybe even hundreds of millions. And so they're incredibly accurate. But I want you to realize that mutations still happen frequently because humans, just us, we have about 3.2 billion nucleotides in our genome. So even if something has an accuracy of having only one in one billion nucleotides screwed up, you'd still expect to get at least three mutations every time a cell copies itself, every time a cell reproduces. Because if a cell reproduces, it has to replicate its DNA, copy it, you know, make that DNA goes from one piece to two pieces that are supposed to be identical. And if it's doing that with 3.2 billion nucleotides, the odds would still be that there's three, maybe four, mutations that occur. So don't think that mutations are common, but at the same time, don't think that they just don't exist very frequently. They occur quite a bit, but usually they occur in sections of DNA that aren't coding for proteins, or they're a silent mutation, or they're a missense mutation that just changes like one amino acid, so there's no real big difference. And so it's just not that often that we get like big changes. Now, just kind of finishing up here, so with these effects, we've talked about that some of them are beneficial. So what that really means is we've said that for evolution, these mutations are critical because when it turns out well, it can give us new alleles, which can give us new traits, you know, new proteins, better proteins that can let us do things better than we did before or let us do things we couldn't do before. So maybe at some point you get a mutation where humans can start to eat and digest grass and a lot of these uh, materials that contain cellulose, these plant materials that we can't break down right now. If you had something like that, that could be a huge advantage. It also gives us diversity by having these new alleles. These are kind of tied together. And that diversity allows us to evolve better because as the environment changes, we have to have mutations already present in a group so that if something changes and some people can't survive, if no one has a mutation that lets them live, everybody just dies. You have extinction. But if some individuals have some of these mutations, have some of these different alleles, then ultimately they can survive, they can reproduce, and they can continue on the population or species as time goes on. Because those guys will all have what is now the good mutation. And some mutations might occur that right now don't appear to be great, but later on could be great when the environment changes. Some examples of this, there's a small town that's Italian where some individuals got a mutation and have passed it on that allows them to prevent atherosclerosis. So this has to do with the arteries in your heart and how they get clogged up. And so this is what would be tied to heart disease. 
So these people essentially have a really low incidence of heart disease because they don't have to worry about a lot of the problems in their heart that we do because of that mutation. Now in bacteria, you'll see that there are many bacteria that have gotten mutations that allows them to resist antibiotics. So when we take an antibiotic or apply one like in soap, they don't die. And then they then live and pass on that mutation, thereby we can have whole colonies, whole groups of bacteria that are now immune to specific antibiotics or very resistant. And so that's why we have to worry about certain pests you might see like MRSA, that's just methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's just a particularly common bacteria that we normally can treat with simple antibiotics, but it's now resistant to all those. So the staph infection is like the most common infection, and if you make that suddenly a super bacteria, because it's resistant to everything we normally fight it with, we now have a big problem because we've got a guy that's widespread that we can't really take care of. And that's being driven by this process of natural selection acting on the fact that we use antibiotics a lot. So those are two examples of what's beneficial. This one's not beneficial for us, but it is for the bacteria. So we're using it from that lens. Keep in mind something might be good for one individual and, or group and bad for another. And of the harmful ones, we get genetic disorders. We've talked about cancer before. That was that somatic cell mutation uh, where our body cells can get mutated by mutagens is what commonly occurs or random. Uh, and if that happens, you can get to cancer where some of your cells now have these mutations that can lead to them reproducing uncontrollably and ultimately can lead to death. The other thing is you have genetic disorders you can inherit. And so if you get this, muta this mutated gene, uh, it can cause a problem. In some cases, it can be lethal. Uh, in others, you'll see like cystic fibrosis, you have a, muta a mutated transport protein that transports uh, chloride ion. So it's just Cl, that's essentially chlorine. It's called chloride as an ion, Cl negative. And so if this guy can't transfer back and forth, it basically makes you build up a bunch of mucus. And this mucus tends to clog your tracts in your digestive system and your respiratory tract, which leads to malfunction, uh, infection, and ultimately leads to death. So people with cystic fibrosis can die very early on, like teens, 20s, uh, if not treated. With treatment, I believe now they can make it into probably like their 40s, 50s, maybe 60s, but they do tend to have a shortened lifespan because this will mess with their, really their lungs and then their digestive system. But that's from a mutation that you would be born with. Uh, so that a lot of your genetic disorders you will get from a parent that has them, which sometimes they can have them, but it can like hide. So even though they have the, the allele, they have the particular gene that codes for it, uh, sometimes they won't actually express it. They won't actually have the disorder. So they could pass it on while not showing it. So they don't have cystic fibrosis as a disorder, but they have the gene, the possibility of it, that they can pass on. And we'll get into that a lot more when we get to Unit 4 when we talk about genetics. All right, that's it for mutations, guys. That's it for 310. I hope you guys enjoyed it.